Okay, let's talk about a case study. So this little guy, um, I love this family. They, um, the mom and dad were both, the father was a principal, former teacher, and mom was a teacher. Very, very, um, as you can imagine, achievement-oriented family. Just delightful, love them. And um, he was eight years, eight months old, right-handed when he came to see me. He wore glasses since the age of nine and a half months. So they picked up pretty early on. There was some sort of visual, spatial, something going on. And he, he's worn collective lenses, which you often don't see in kids picked up that early. So that was a real plus. Um, they were really concerned his social skills lagged behind his peers. And he observed other kids, but he wouldn't go in and play. So he'd sit on the playground, and you hear this a lot from parents of kids on the spectrum, that he'd sit at the edge and sort of watch the other kids, but he wouldn't get in there, okay? So school personnel, as you might imagine, were really in tune with this family. So they were corroborating, because they were all friends, they were corroborating everything the parents were saying. So I had absolutely no disagreement between what the school was seeing and what the parents were saying, which is a great situation, because um, a lot of times you don't have that luxury, as I'm sure you guys see. Dressing, copying shapes, late, language skills were described as good from birth. So there was no general language delay. Okay, so right away in your investigator mode, what sorts of things are you starting to think about, even just with the first two? Asperger's. Yeah. Asperger's, what else? NVLD. NVLD, what else? Social anxiety. He's clearly interested, so my thought process is he's clearly interested in social interactions because he's sitting on the edge and watching the other kids. Then you tease out why he's not able to engage. Okay, I've got the motor stuff going on, which a lot of on the autism spectrum kids have motor stuff going on. Okay, it doesn't sort of wash well in the literature, meaning it's not become part of the diagnosis so much um, in a lot of ways, um, but and how it's quantified, it is in the stereotypical behaviors, but um, it, it really is a precursor to language is how I think of it. Formal diagnosis of NVLD by four professionals, a diagnosis of PDD and OVS, so pervasive development disorder, not otherwise specified, ruled out because of his language skills. Asperger's syndrome was also ruled out because of his lack of restricted and repetitive stereotype patterns of behavior or interest. Autism not considered because of his language abilities. So what do you have left? You really only have NVLD left, which is learning disability not otherwise specified for this little guy. You don't have, this shows the problem, because there's clearly something going on. NVLD isn't recognized by most people. Alternative diagnoses, schizotypal, schizoid, schizophrenia with childhood onset, and bipolar. He was emotionally labile. So by that I mean he was certainly, there was a part of him that would have meltdowns, very typical of kids on the spectrum, especially if their routine gets interrupted. But he didn't have the routine. Um, but there certainly was some emotional ability. Okay, so when I say that cognitively, think about back to my battery, what sorts of tests do I think he's not gonna do well on? Executive function, okay? Executive function is your ability to control emotions, stop, start, brings in the highs and lows. So that's why it gets more important, even more important, to look at other, all the aspects of executive function. I actually did, we we're gonna look at be, uh, uh, the brief, I've actually got brief results, I think, in here on this one, a behavior rating inventory of executive function. Cognitive skills, so this gives you, in that report format that I talked about earlier, um, overall intellectual function, Look at that split, that VIQ is 110, PIQ 69. Ooh. You see where came in? Yeah, yeah, yikes. Achievement, reading and spelling average with mechanical arithmetic borderline. So if you gave him the RAT, the wide range achievement, um, wide range achievement test, which I actually don't like that test at all. Um, if I'm gonna test math, I give the key math. Key math is wonderful. Executive function, average except visual attention and knock and tap. Language, average to superior on all language tests. 
Sensory motor, very, very slow, deficient. Couldn't do much of anything on any motor, slow. Might be able to do it ultimately, but it was taking an hour. Still couldn't tie his shoes at eight and a half to nine. Average for simple visual spatial, as you can imagine, poor for complex or motor component. Average for everything except names for memory and learning. Could not remember names of anybody. Social and emotional, could name most emotions, but could not tell you how he came to the results. So he could tell me that I was happy, but when I try to say, so what did you look at? What did I do to show you I was happy? I don't know. So he couldn't break it down into component parts. Like, I saw you smile, I saw your eyebrows raise, I heard the tone of your voice go higher pitch. He couldn't do that. Not good at all. And elevated levels of psychosis on the pick. Does anybody still use the pick? Personality inventory of children. Um, don't ever use it. <laughs> I'm sorry, testing company, so I didn't say that. Um, you know, it's, 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 um, they may have renormed it now, and if so, give it a shot. Uh, it was not renormed for a long period of time, and there are some questions on there that parents really responded negatively to, which that's the worst when a parent responds negatively to the process of evaluation, because you want to engage them. And his levels of psychosis, seeing things, those sorts of issues, because of the visual spatial issue, are going to come up elevated. That's why it's really important to sort of break down and then I look at the BASC, when I go down, when I get the BASC, the behavioral assessment of children, then I start seeing what's loading. Because kids with a visual spatial issue, who else told me they give the Rorschach and they test it on the Rorschach? Yeah, you know. You know, it's the question of whether a Rorschach is valid with these kids becomes an issue because whether or not they see distorted visual spatial and all things, especially when this little guy from what age, you know, had glasses so early on, there's clearly something visual spatial going on with this kid. That is the thread through this kid, okay? What do I have to put this kid in for visual spatial def deficit? Zippo, okay? It's fairly clear to me that this kid's social issues are probably coming from the visual impairments, starting to become apparent to me. So the question became, are his social and psychiatric difficulties primary or a result of his cognitive profile? Psychosis and poor reciprocal, extreme motor difficulties, complex visual spatial deficits, and some limited executive impairment. We're going to go back to a study in a moment. But what do you guys think? What, what would you do with this profile? Well, I have a question. Uh -huh. If he's got a visual problem, I wonder if he would respond to verbal social cues better than nonverbal, like tone of voice and words and stuff like that. So he does. He, he, um, we're going to look at my data, but this is actually, I picked him up during my dissertation. N numero many years ago now um, and that's exactly right so on math if I tested math doing it non visually spatially he blew the charts off of math because I saw a blind child and she exhibited many of these same symptoms and it's like well of course how can you respond to nonverbal social cues exactly you can't see? exactly so you would say you present the math problem auditorily and then he could yes okay. yeah it's when I asked him to line up numbers or do things from a visual spatial deficit that he bombed. So if you explain math and gave word problems, they, they can do very well. Again, mine's a small sample. It's a very small sample. These kids are really hard to pick up. I had samples from um, the Columbia medical files, um, the Yale medical files trying to pick these kids up and have a discrete protocol to put them into groups to study, very hard. I couldn't find, I wanted a sample size originally of 50 plus kids, I couldn't find that many who met the criteria. And that's why it's become very um, hard to sort of have people believe in. A lot of skeptics out there. But these kids exist, he clearly had deficits, right? Clearly had social issues. It fits the description of NVLD um, he clearly has something going on. If you look at the literature on the description of minimal brain dysfunction that was in the 60s, 70s, 
he fits that category. If you look at semantic pragmatic disorder, he fits that sort of category, and his speech was like that. Um, interestingly, his tone and prosody were a little off. Even though he could get verbal prompts, his tone and prosody were a little bad. Um, he, um, he's great, I'll never forget one time in a group, it was near Halloween, and uh, I came in for the group, and I was co-leading it with somebody, and all of a sudden he took his shoes off um, and put them in my face. Does anybody know what was going on? Trick or treat, smell my feet, give me something oh, good to eat. <laughs> so those are the sorts of things that these kids will do. Well, you know, I thought it was funny. I didn't laugh at the time, but because um, I was trying to sort of <laughs> help him understand good social relationships. But what do you think that does to another kid? Not so much, right? It's like part of the issue with these kids, too, is I'll say, okay, I'll try to teach the concept of good personal space, like arm's length away, and then you'll get a teacher who says, okay, stand next to the person next to you, and they'll go, no, but Dr. Bonnie told me an arm's length away, and they'll get in trouble. So these are the kids who it's really hard to teach social interactions because it changes all the time. And gosh knows it's even harder for adolescents, right? How do you explain gossip and sort of all the things and bullying and things that happen in adolescence age? Sarcasm is one of the hardest things to pick up. Thank you for bringing that up, absolutely. So these are the kids who are really hard and a social group where other kids can give them feedback and work that. If you can get an adolescent lunch bunch kids going at school or one of those adolescent social skills groups and if there isn't one, start one. You know, start one because you will be extremely busy. Start one um, because there aren't enough. He did really well, as you can imagine, his parents were pretty involved, which is, I think, a key. But they were also very much of the mind that they weren't going to have him be different and special, that, that he was just going to have to work harder, and that this was a no brainer, but he was going to have to work harder, and uh, he's doing really well. So I think if there's one key to success for these kids, it's that you will have to work different and harder. That's the attitude that gets kids through college. So what diagnosis did you end up with? Was it out of pocket? This school was really great with me because they let me, they actually were open. I went to the IEP meeting for this little guy um, and they were very open to the NVLD diagnosis um, on learning disability not otherwise specified is where we ended up and they got it. Some schools look at me like I have three heads. Um, so learning disability not otherwise specified is usually where I go with these kids. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the executive function impairment, you can get, you can cobble some things on that's more in vogue. I didn't want to put him in an autism because what happens when you put this child with an autism diagnosis or something on the spectrum, even though I think there probably was room for me to do it. Part of that, they'd look at the language, but I think I probably, in that day and age, and this is a while ago, and I might not be able to do it now, I could think I could fit him into the Asperger's diagnosis this day and age, because people are so lax about the restrictor and repetitive. Do I think he had it? No. This was not a kid with classic Asperger's syndrome described originally. It just the restrictor and repetitive interest, he was way more social. The reason I don't is the minute you give kids an autism diagnosis, they're putting them with kids with 60, 70 IQs. And so this kid was not gonna do well with a group of kids who are lower functioning. Therein lies, I think, one of the biggest issues is that when you get into a classroom environment, if they have one class and they're not doing push-in, and you know, this, to make it in the mainstream classroom, what's this little guy gonna need? In terms of actual services, you're asking? Yeah. An aid. He's gonna need a one-on-one -on -one aid. And that's really hard to get these days you better be pretty impaired. Now, his 69 PIQ, I could go there with him. And because the parents were in the school system, quite frankly, we knew how to advocate for this little guy, and they got it. And he got a lot of services, and his parents put him in social groups after school and all those sorts of things. But, you know, this, he's a hard one, because who do you put him with? You put him with mainstream peers, and once he gets to be about 13, 14, things start cooking too fast, and he gets taken advantage of if you're not, if school personnel aren't really watching and he's in a bigger classroom. You put him with IQs, the lower IQ kids, lower functioning kids, into a special classroom, and he's bored to tears, and he's not challenged. It's 
it's really a hard, and therein lies the issue, and that's why in places like, a lot of places on the East Coast have gone to whole schools just for kids on the spectrum, or this sort of issue. Ivy Mount um, in, on the East Coast just does kids, you know, perfect school for this type of kiddo, because it's higher functioning kids who have the social problems. Questions? Yeah. Just out of curiosity, has any imaging work done with the kids with the MVLD and what was that? Like? A little bit. Right hemisphere, mostly based, maybe a white matter, matter deficit. Um, diffusion tensor imaging, which actually looks at the fiber tracks. Uh -huh. um, some validity for the white matter model. Okay. That it's uh, actually when information is taken in and it's processed in the parietal, temporal, and occipital, that area there in terms of somehow how it processes could be an issue. The other thing is an issue for these kids, which is sort of my um, big theory. Part of it is this, these kids are so diverse and we lump them all together right now. And so we need to have good epidemiological research to be able to sort them out, but you have to do batteries on a thousand kids. Who has time to do that for a study? So it never gets, that's research that doesn't really get done. But part of the issue on those kids is, um, you know, certainly if you're looking at PT, a, a parietal temporal occipital, that whole area, one other area to look at is Broadman's 40 and visual spatial. So a lot of the mental manipulation and sort of meant the work that's been done looking at the manipulation of visual spatial information in the brain, all of which circles around parietal area up here, Broadman's 40, um, primarily right hemisphere, certainly that's implicated. Um, my hunch is, is probably like they're finding an autism, mirror neurons are somehow implicated as well, which will allow us to show empathy and to sort of be able to read the minds of other people. To look a little bit more at the, um, work that I did for part of my dissertation. Again, I looked at over 4,000 medical charts. And this were not, these were major medical centers. I could find 60 who met the criteria. So basically what I said is you had to have at least a 10 point split between the VC and PO. Why did I, why did I say that? I want it to be statistically significant, right? If it's less than eight, it's not even statistically significant on the WISC. And the VCI, PCI, any more, um, you know, those differences, I think it's 12 to be clinically significant now. Somebody will look at the manual and tell me. FSIQ, I wanted at least average, and so I wanted it hanging in there. I wanted to have a pretty tight age range, um, and I wanted to have, um, some motor deficits, but again, that criterion ended up being really hard to fulfill. I'd find people with a split who didn't have the motor, or I'd find people who had all the motor issues but didn't have a big enough split, um, had some clear visual spatial, so it was really hard to categorize, which is why this isn't making it into DSM-5, because it's really hard to do this research and find kids who meet all the criteria. Things that I looked at, key math revised, behavior rating inventory of executive function. Um, Jerry Joya actually was kind enough to give me um, before it was even out. Um, and so got to use that in my dissertation. The NEPSI, I used all the executive function measures off the NEPSI, the trails A and B. I love trails A and B, by the way, for kids. Does anybody else still use that? I love it, it's my favorite. And it's, if anybody wants a copy of it, I can send it to you because it's really hard to find. Trails A and B with the norms, um, it's just one of my favorite executive function tests. It's a sequencing test and the norms off of the original one, the kitty one, I think are, nor are better than the norms off the Dallas Kaplan executive function battery. You're shaking your head, yes. Yeah, I, I find that kids with executive prompts on, on condition B, when you have to switch between letters and numbers, right away it picks them up, so very good. Um, child and adolescent social perception measure, VMI, visual and motor, and personality inventory for children. So this was something I felt would pick them up, but allow me to rule out. So when you talk about before Bonnie, what would you do for a neuropsych screener? You know, what I've used for a neuropsych screener here, um, the only thing I would, in retrospect, add to this would be the ray. The ray, if they can't take it in and draw it, I can either look at motor issues or visual spatial. How they organize it, I'm looking at executive, and if they can't remember it, I get memory. I mean, that's what I love about the ray. There's so many aspects to that test that give, you get in one test. So if I'm going to do a screener, I um, include a ray, and I've actually I gave to 2,000 kids 
I've got small mini batteries on 200, but sorry, on 3,000 kids when we screened, we looked at the relationship between a full battery and a smaller portion, and I'm trying to do a neuropsych screener battery now. Because not everybody needs a full neuropsych, right. but there's not a good battery out there, and I think it would do well. I think we need it. It's time. So I'm created and going to try to norm it. So this is all that I gave off the NEPSI, just to sort of you asked me before what uh, the memory, um, the executive function, I gave tower, auditory, visual, design fluency, knock and tap. I gave speed and naming, comprehension of instructions, fluency, imitating hand, visual motor precision, finger, um, fingertip, where you touch their fingertips and they tell you what finger they're, tupping, they're touching, arrows, block construction, route finding, memory for faces, memory for names, sentence repetition. So if these kids were going to have a deficit, I was going to find it. <laughs> um, key math, I gave key concepts, operations, and applications, and I used all the brief behavior rating inventory of executive function. So things that I found. So I put kids into th one of three groups. I put them into nonverbal learning disability group, a control group where it was even, but I also looked at them against the verbal learning disability kids because there's a whole thread in the literature that says these higher functioning kids on the spectrum who are a little off socially um, are actually um, more depressed than kids with verbal learning issues. So I wanted to sort of look at how the whole depression in these kids, because I think it's something that's way underdiagnosed with kids on the spectrum. I think looking at depression and how these kids experience depression is a really important issue. And you treat that sense of isolation, it becomes very important. Because if these kids are higher functioning and on the Asperger side, at some point they become aware that they're not like other kids and that they're not doing well and they're not relating and they're interested and they keep not knowing how to do it. And so it's like a little dog who can't get out of the box. And so it becomes very hard. And I actually found that kids, interestingly enough, with verbal learning disabilities were actually more depressed than kids with right hemisphere disorders, which totally contradicts what you find in the literature. Key math concepts, what I actually found is that the nonverbal learning disability kids did better on math concepts than the kids with verbal learning disabilities. Because when I tested it on a language-based system, who would do worse? So they could do math, it was how you were testing it. Very important. Social skills, so if you look at this, the controls were doing really well in total emotion and average on nonverbal cues. What I found is that the kids with nonverbal learning disabilities like I told you, they can't break down the emotion. Sometimes they can get it, but they have no idea how they get there. So they often get it wrong. Basically, you can misread. If you're doing emotions on a holistic basis, which is what a lot of times the kids on the higher functioning end of the spectrum do, because they'll miss the subtle signs, they learn the intervention or they learn good enough to label the all over emotion, they will miss the subtleties of nonverbal communication. And that's really the key because your intervention for the higher functioning kids then becomes teaching the subtleties of social interaction. And to do that in a group setting becomes incredibly important. For the lower functioning kids, it's a different issue because a lot of those kids aren't even interested in social interactions. And especially if 40% don't have language, the issue becomes helping them become interested in social interactions. That's a much different intervention. Things that were elevated for the verbal learning disability kids, look at that depression level, highly elevated. Things, um, social skills deficits in the kids with NVLD, obviously that's what you expect to be highest. Um, verbal learning disability kids actually had better social skills, um, withdrawal about equal for everybody, a little bit higher for the verbal learning disability kids, anxiety, um, pretty much the same in the nonverbal learning disability group and the verbal learning disability group. So again, it's higher functioning kids on the spectrum who start to become aware of their issues, have higher rates, I found higher rates of depression, higher rates of anxiety. And again, those are things we tend to skip over when we're treating this group, which I think it's pretty important data. A lot of the a great neurologist I worked with uh, in New York, 
um, would use atypical antipsychotics pretty effectively for some of the anxiety and the depression symptoms in these kids. Executive functions, you'll see they're pretty equal here. The only thing that I found a difference on was on the Nepsi Tower Trask and also block construction. Is anybody, how many of you are familiar with the Nepsi? So the block construction, it has that 3D component. Mm -hmm. So those kids all put the block construction task straight on the table. So they never gave it the three-dimensional component. Really interesting. They'd get the design right, but it wouldn't be three-dimensional. So um, one of the key findings. <laughs>